Hey, everybody. Welcome back to On the Porch Swing. My name is Laura Wellington. I'm your host, and we are normally on the porch swing. <laughs> but tonight, we're not because it is cold outside in Connecticut. So I'm not sitting my fanny out there. I'm going to be doing it from inside my office. And occasionally, you're going to see a background of the porch swing. <laughs> so just pretend. Um, tonight, we have a wonderful guest. Um, he has an incredible story about how he was saved. And um, I came across him on TikTok and it just blew me away. So I wanted to um, bring him on, share his story, and have him talk about himself and his journey and where he plans to go, uh, what the future holds for him. But first, let's watch this video because it is, it is really a life story um, to be known and one that's really, really inspirational. So here we go. You're not going to want to scroll past this. It will be the most interesting thing you've heard all day. Check it out. This guy was actually famous at the birth of social networking on a website called MySpace. He had this crazy goth emo imagery, this gender bending stuff before anyone had even heard of it. He had a crazy dark side. He began to delve into witchcraft and Satanism and all kinds of secret societies. And when MySpace died and all the partying and the glamour was over with, the partying turned to desperate alcoholism. And the only company he had left were the demons inside of him driving him mad. There seemed to be no escape for him as suicide was looming. But then something crazy happened. He cried out to God for help. God restored his sanity and put him on a new path. And Jesus was the reason. He went from this to this. But that's not even the craziest part. You won't believe this. That man is me. Subscribe to find out more. That man is him. <laughs> that's him. That's who we have. His name is Adam Prout, and he's going to join me. Hey, Adam. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> Good. What a story. What a story. Yeah. 20 years I tried to fit into a 30 second TikTok. So I'm glad that you is... up on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of stuff that happened in 20 years. So yes. let's begin. Tell me a little bit more about your backstory. How did you end up as a MySpace creator, you know, megastar? And then what happened? Tell tell me all of it. And then you will obviously talk about where you're going from here. For sure. Yeah, I guess first I'll say um, I actually grew up in Connecticut. So you saying you were there, it <laughs> makes me uh, miss the cold. Actually, I'm down south now in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I grew <laughs> up waiting for the school bus in that bitter winter Connecticut cold. So I'm actually always hot down here. I kind of miss it. <laughs> We always want to come back up and visit. It yeah. is cold outside, but let me tell you, it's oh, really snuck up it. on us. It just it stays with you the rest of your life, and, and oh, everyone yeah. just feels hot, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, before that, I was born in Boston, and uh, I had a, a pretty troublesome childhood, I, and I don't say that to be a victim. Um, it's just a it's a part of the story, and it, it leads to the, the happy outcome, of course, um, but because of that, I mean, uh, when you, I don't know how much, how much of this is true in Connecticut, but when you're in Boston and you're a part of an Irish family, uh, you're, it's like the law to be Catholic. You have to be like, there's no way to avoid it. So I grew up Catholic. Um, and so due to the, uh, upbringing that I had, I, I began to around my teenage years really view Christianity in general as just kind of a, a hypocritical thing. And that's what started turning me on to um, other people to sort of deconstruct that. So I started reading like Anton LaVey, who is the founder of Satanism, Marilyn Manson's autobiography, um, Nietzsche, anything I could to sort of undo everything and just go to the other extreme. Just because I was so, as a teenager, I was like 18 or 19 when this happened. I was so angry about everything, like all the all the anxiety and everything growing up turned to anger and I was seeking some way to empower myself. So I sought out a lot of that through occultism, you know, black magic. It was just going from kind of one extreme to another, I guess. And um, 
I eventually got kicked out of my house and I was homeless and that was really kind of a crazy time. And through that homelessness, I was, you know, going out in the inner city nightlife of Boston. And so I was sort of uh, embracing the, the, the punk rock kids and the goth kids and all that. And uh, somehow I had a job through all of this. That's one thing I've always had is really great work ethic. Work <laughs> ethic. So I was literally, I remember the day 9-11 happened, I was in a hostel. Like I had a, I got, I got a hostel that night to sleep in and I went to a bagel shop and I saw 9-11 on the TV in the in the, the breakfast place. And I was it didn't even matter to me because I was like, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. It was just so mm. such a weird time. Um, and so I'm going to work this whole time, but I'm, I'm, I'm diving deeper and deeper into this darkness. And I'm going to these goth clubs every night and everyone's just loving me. And I'm becoming like I'm emulating the character of the rock star that's sort of how this right. all expressed itself. So I'm like, how do I be like Marilyn Manson and people before him, David Bowie and Alice Cooper and, um, you know, dark, dark musicians, nine inch right. nails. So I'm reading all their autobiographies and, and, you know, Oh, Motley Crue's on the bus doing cocaine with Ozzy Osbourne. And, and I'm like, these guys are crazy. I got to top them off. And it became like the blueprint for my friends and I, who were trying to start these bands. Um, because, what we were doing was trying to get mass adoration than the right. love that we didn't get as kids, you know? So we're like, right. let's find it in other ways. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, that's, that, that was the, the chaoticness of like, I don't even know if that's the word chaoticness, but I just made it up. <laughs> Go with it. Go with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm running on, on fumes. It's been crazy, but uh, I'll, I'll try my best to have my brain work a little bit better. Um, but yeah, so that was like the first chapter that was sort of the, the becoming of, of Adam absinthe and, um, around the time, um, where my time was drawing to a close in Boston and I was heading out to California. That was about 2005. Uh, the birth of social networking happened and yeah. it started with a, a website called friendster actually. And this girl at my job was like, Oh, you got to go on this site. And, I was like, I don't, I don't have time for that. Like, and you know, I'm too busy going to the bar, getting drunk, trying to get girls and stuff. Like, why would I, what is this internet thing? Like, you know? And so she's like this, and this is a girl I was working at urban outfitters. So she comes in one day and goes, I signed you up. I made a profile for you. You got to check it out. So I get on there and it is what it is. But then there's a competitor site that comes out called MySpace, and right. uh, people are really picking up on that. And so I start using both of them and, and I like it. It's like you can chat to people who aren't there like you're, oh, you're in another state. This is interesting. So I'm still in Boston and I come across this guy's profile who's in a band in Florida. I've never told anyone this. This is the first time. Um, and his profile blew me away because he was like, it was all debauchery and degeneracy. And he was just this total rock star and he had all the makeup on the colored hair and he just really branded himself well. And he was in this band in Florida and I was like, this is what I want to be. And I learned that you can be anyone you want to be on the internet and nobody has to know anything about you you could just be like this is who i am take it or leave it and and people will believe you so i was like my goodness i can do all these people i've been looking up to these rock stars i'm going to create this brand this persona on myspace like this kid did and because i was one of the first users i think i was in myspace in the hyperlink or in the url used to put what number user you were at the end instead of your name. So it was like right. 153,000 or something like very early on in, in, in context of the millions that join later. Oh, so, so um, yeah, that started picking up and picking up. And um, I was suddenly getting this mass adoration I wanted on a larger scale. I, it didn't have to be a, a club, a local club at night. Now I could mm -hmm. get it across the whole country if I wanted to. And so it was growing and um, I think, uh, uh, you know, if I get into romances and stuff, that will, that would take like three <laughs> weeks. To, but okay. I'm trying to figure out how to consolidate this. I, I, was t I moved to California. I moved to Canada for for a, a romance that I found online, but that didn't work out. So I moved back down to California, and uh, I moved around a lot. And at, at that point, um, I was uh, really getting. A lot of notoriety on MySpace, and I started thinking, 
uh, gosh, how am I going to do a day job and this? Like, I'm getting a lot of opportunities, and people were uh, in California saying, like, oh, I have a, I have an agent. She could work with you, and you know, I, I will manage you and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. So I went, I went back to California to to do this full time. Um, and the only way I could do that was just to be the cliche chaotic rock star who's sleeping on people's couches and um, just like living off of them and uh, going and partying is, all night. Did you do that? Were you doing that? Then? It, it was your... the total cliche. It was the Hollywood band mm -hmm. cliche. We're going to go and be rock stars, but really all we're going to do is live on girls' couches, drink and do drugs all night and get like nothing done in the studio. It was it was blueprint thousands and thousands of kids go out and do that <laughs> and we right. were no different you know and, and the right. motley crews and the guns and roses and all them are uh, it's just a roll of the dice it's like winning the lotto so right. They, right they could live like that too but then they had a record company paying for it you know so right. that's that was it was just total chaos and insanity and uh but things were happening um we reached out to hot topic to sell merchandise um the the some somebody behind m m and 50 cent at interscope had reached out to me and i was like this is my chance but they didn't have any interest they were like we already have a marilyn manson we don't know what to do with you but we have this cartoon you could be like a voice for and i was like no that's not what i want and i turned that down and uh i pretty much you know went from a good worth e ethic to just getting so enamored by attention and uh it was all we didn't know about dopamine and all that stuff and and right. you know getting lost online for hours and we didn't know anything about that and we didn't know about getting famous online we were just kind of paving the way um right. other people were doing it at the time this is a gentleman named jeffrey star who's still very famous to this day just famous yeah. for being famous you know uh tila right. tequila she was another myspace person and then she became a reality tv show star um and and people were people were getting uh inspired by me and like kind of we I, I was sort of setting the ground rules for everybody to do later um i remember going to a club and adam lambert who was like an american idol contestant was just like oh you've been such an inspiration to me and like two years later he's on american idol looking exactly like adam absinthe with the makeup and the hair and everything and i mean to right. be fair tons of people were doing that that was right. the era, you know, uh, the swoopy bangs and the eyeliner and everything. But um, Adam, what Adam, what were your parents doing when you back in Boston? How did they feel? What was there any communication during this time or? No, I had a falling out in my early twenties, and um, I just uh, I said, you know, I, I just had so much hatred for the way I grew up, and I we cut off everything, and that lasted for like a decade. So they had no part of any of that they don't they don't even know they don't they didn't know anything that was going on and at the time um you know i was such a shipwreck and such an orphan i was finding these relationships in the clubs and uh I was sort of emulating the toxicity of my upbringing in my personal relationships so band breakups and girl breakups and drinking and drugs and all this stuff so um, it's interesting that that was, it was just pure chaos. So yeah, no family stuff. And, and I would, uh, be sort of a role model for other kids who grew up like that. And I'd be like, right. you can empower yourself with anti, anti everything, just be a uh, witchcraft and Satanism right. and rock and roll, you know, just be right. anti, anti, anti establishment, um, as liberal as you can get. And that's how you're going to empower yourself. So when did you, when did you hit bottom? Tell me about that aspect of the story. Okay. Um, and then what happened after that? Um, so MySpace started to die. Rupert Murdoch of, from Fox News, oh, the previous owner of Fox News, um, Viacom, he actually bought MySpace and just tanked it. I don't know what happened there. And Facebook was on the rise at that time. So Facebook was sort of replacing uh, MySpace. I know Justin Timberlake tried to buy it a little bit after and resurrect it for like a music site, but just a total failure. Um, a lot of people evolved and they started using Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. I I was kind of over it. I worked so hard at it. I was really burnt out and I, I was dating somebody at the time and I was like, this is it. My whole life is just going to be about being in love and 
uh, I'm going to be a normal person and all that. And the uh, the thing that when it really hit me was I had uh, broken up with her. I moved into a sober living home, not to get sober, but my friends were all ex drunks and druggies and stuff. So they're like, one of them was like, just come live with me. It's the, you can stay here for free. And so I live in, I, I get in this sober living home. I get a sponsor and all this stuff. Um, and I go to uh, H&M and get a job there. Like I'm folding clothes. And I remember like, gosh, this is quite different. I remember I walk out on my lunch break from H&M, my little half hour lunch break, making minimum wage. And I look up in the Disney store and I see myself on TV in a Mitchell Musso music video. It's like a goth high schooler kid in that. Um, I forgot. I had this whole acting career. I forgot to mention that. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I transferred over into acting, but it was very brief, less than two okay. years. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, yeah that's brief. <laughs> yeah, it was very brief. I did get screen actors eligible, though. I got a couple of small things, a Guitar Center commercial and stuff, but I was in music video. Disney loved me. They they wanted me to be the goth high schooler, which was funny. I was like 30, but that's how it is in Hollywood, you know? So uh, I see myself on TV and I'm looking at people in the mall like, do you guys see this? Like, And it, I, it hit me there. I was like, it's over, man. The glory days are over. So from there, it was just a matter of like, wow, you know, I have to deal with how lost I am and figure out what I want to do in my life. So I went to college. I was like, let's go to college. And which is funny because I barely graduated high school. I didn't, I was sitting on the seats graduation day, not sure if they were going to call my name or not. Um, so I got into college and started that. And uh, I, I lived with another girlfriend. I wasn't saved yet. I wasn't Christian. And um, when sh she ended up cheating on me and then being like, yeah, sorry, you got to move out. So I had to live in my car all over again at age 31 while I was trying to get a degree and be a normal person. And I lost my mind. I was like, I'm going back to Hollywood. I'm sick of it. You know, when I was like MySpace famous and doing this, that, and the other thing, everyone loved me. I didn't have these problems. So I went back and I reverted. But now I'm like 30, 31. Hangovers were killing me. I, I couldn't keep up with these young kids. <laughs> and uh, it was just total, total chaos. And I managed <laughs> to get my life together. Um, within that year, I moved to Orange County, started working as a makeup artist for Mac Cosmetics at Nordstrom okay. because, you know, tattoos and all makeup and the hair and everything like where, what, where can I fit in and still get like a, a, a wage, you know? Um, and so that was, uh, that was the time I started getting very heavy into occultism and witchcraft. And I got uh, involved in secret societies, I, I went and became I, like st the first initiation for Freemasonry. Um, I went to these black masses at a um, secret society called the Ordo Templi Orientis, which was founded by Aleister Crowley. Um, so I'm really getting into some dark, dark stuff. Right. And I'm like starting to have like dreams about demons and all this stuff. And I'm channeling things as I'm doing my artwork. I've always been a visual artist, too. I've always drawn and stuff like that. Um, and I'm kind of losing my mind too. all the sin, the drugs, the alcohol, the witchcraft. I'm losing my mind. I'm becoming like a uh, lesion in the Bible. I'm wandering around all night long. Uh, I was like cutting myself with glass, broken bottles. I would, uh, wow. I would, yeah, it got really, really weird and crazy. At one point I even saw demons. I have a full testimony video on my YouTube. It's a 35 minute version. And I go into this, uh, it's the TikTok extent the TikToks like the cliff right. notes and this is like the full film um yeah. so i go into this there but I, I saw demons and when you're into the occultism and the witchcraft and all the esoteric stuff and the new age and everything it, you don't really understand the 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 gravity of that you kind of think you're in control of it and i had a very good understanding of the supernatural and at that point right. so from there it was only a matter of um losing your mind and drinking yourself to death or something mm -hmm. radical has to pull you out of this. And so I ended up uh, moving to Seattle. I was trying to escape all the chaos and everything to start over. And of course your sins and demons will follow you wherever you go. You can't just okay. geographically locate cause they're in a different realm, you know? So <laughs> I just yeah. like, Oh gosh, I, I somehow, this is the work ethic. I worked every day and I got my degree and, uh, I was, um, the, the height of it was, uh, me, I was drinking every night. I was that guy, you know, you go to seven 11 in the morning and you kick the guy off the curb out of your way, sleeping, waiting for it to yeah. wake up. Yeah. I, I was, or to open, I was that guy. 
And I would go out all night long, all night and wander just like, and one night I fell into a river in the middle of the winter. It had missing person signs on it and everything. I was in a small, small town called Sultan, Washington, about an hour from Seattle. And uh, I managed to claw my way out and I was sopping wet, went home, fell asleep. The next day I woke up and I was, you know, <laughs> kind of sickly and hung over. I'm now in my late thirties and I, I can't handle this at all. And I just fell to my knees on the floor and my whole life flashed before my eyes, the, the childhood, the wild ups and downs in the personal relationships, the MySpace fame, the Hollywood glamour, the partying. And it just hit me. Nobody is here. You have no friends. You're not married. You have no children. Nobody in your family ever cared about you. There's, it was the ultimate like loneliness. And I was just, I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I, why can't I die? I keep trying to drink my, I was too much of a coward to kill myself. So I just kept trying to drink myself to right. like, maybe a truck will run me over when I'm drunk or something like just that. It was like a leaving Las Vegas thing. And just, I'm just going to drink myself to death. And uh, I was like, why can't I die? And the culmination of everything happened. I fell to my knees and I cried out to God. I had, the God I had mocked on my space, the God I had turned away from. I mean, I wrote terrible lyrics about Jesus and stuff. I was an awful person um, when it came to Christians and, and um, Jesus and God. And, you know, when you get when you're desperate and humble and you fall to your knees and cry out, the Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I crawled back into bed after crying out to him for help. I woke up the next day uh, feeling like really light and different. And um, I started making small changes in my life, clearing out the fridge of alcohol and throwing the ramen, ramen away. And, you know, maybe you should eat some salad or something like just weird things started happening. And uh, at the time, this is around 2016, there's a conservative movement happening. It, it was right around the time of Trump. And so before big tech was censoring all these conservative people, they were kind of going viral on social media. So I started right. listening to people, you know, the, the Steven Crowders, the Charlie Kirks, the Daily Wire people, like, and this is when they just first started, like before people had heard of them. And they all kept saying the same, oh, Judeo-Christian values, Judeo-Christian values, like, you know, Western civilization is built on this, you know, conservatism is built on this. And uh, I think just the repetitiveness of hearing that made me get curious about um, God again. So I just started going back to Catholic church. I didn't know anything else. I didn't know any better. And I remember going to the confession booth and telling him all my sins, uh, you know, and he just like a wooden rosary bead flipped over the divider <laughs> for me to grab. And I was like, I grabbed it like, and he was like, go say these two prayers. You can Google them and you're fine. So I went home and did it. And I was remember thinking this can't be right. Like I've had abortions, like, unbelievable evil how can me googling this prayer do anything it doesn't make sense so i knew something was wrong but you know th so that led me on a journey to start discovering other types of churches and i went on a whole tour lutheran methodist all this stuff and um and uh one day i ran into a bar because i was not saved and still living in sin and uh this woman saw this rosary cross i had on and she's like, are you Christian? I told her I used to be a witch and all this stuff, um, traditional witch and, you know, from my ancestors in Ireland and all this. But, yeah, I'm looking into Jesus now. And she recommended a book called Bondage Breaker by Dr. Neil T. Anderson. So I, I got that a few months later. I started reading it. And I'm like, gosh, there's all these like scripture passages. Maybe I should get a Bible. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. And that was the first move into the word that would lead me to really, truly seeking after God, which would lead me to a church in Southern California because I moved once I was once I was done with college. I was like, I'm done with Seattle, moved to Southern California and I went to a church and I got saved there at a men's retreat because I, I was preached the reality of hell and the importance of sin and why we need Jesus. And so I stayed awake all night, like, am I going to hell? I couldn't sleep. I was like sweating. Uh, and, uh, and I was surrounded by all these Christian men at this retreat, at this conference center in, in uh, Big Bear, California. And uh, I started talking to them. I'm like, what do, what's going on? Like, you know, and so um, around that, that time, that same month, there was this conviction of sin. I was like, wait a minute, I can't keep getting drunk. I can't like sleep with people. Um, 
because I, I actually believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And if that's true, if he did that for me, then I got to start living for him and like change what's going on. And the, the instant I believed it, I never believed it. Even growing up as a Catholic, I didn't get it. I was like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. This guy died, whatever. Like I'm going to live my life. Awesome. Free sin card. Thank you, sir. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is real. He did like, he went through that for me. <laughs> and so right. once I believed it, you know, the Bible says the, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in us. And that's what's beginning to sanctify us and lead us to become more Christ-like. And so I understood that. And so I turned my whole life around. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed, the new has come. I think it's Second Corinthians 5, 17. And I said, well, then, the, yeah, the old is gone. Uh, and you hear about like Phil Robertson talk about this from Duck mm -hmm. Dynasty. He mm -hmm. tells his old friends, the old Phil is gone. Get out of here. I don't want anything to do with that anymore. Yeah. This is the new one. And that same thing happens to all believers when they're truly born again. You know, when you hear that right. expression, born again. So I finally got born again. And once that happened, I was like, okay, I'm going to live for Jesus now. And, but this, is, and this is important. I'd like people who are listening to, to hear this. I was still in a very dark place for about two years because nobody preached um, healing and deliverance. And so I had, you know, the sins of my past, even though I was forgiven for them there, they leave a scar, you know? So it's like, I, I didn't get fixed overnight. And so I started looking into other denominations that were maybe a little bit more on the charismatic side who talked about demons and the supernatural and deliverance and healing and stuff like that. And that's when, um, this was about mm, a year and a half ago. That's when I, I had deliverance and all this stuff done. And then all of a sudden my calling became clear. Um, I was making all this music on MySpace, and I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't I see this? I need to make music again, but make it to glorify God. So I start making a song. It took me like six months, got it on Spotify and iTunes, official musician now, and like 10 people listened to it. And I'm like, uh, okay, Lord, I, I know I'm supposed to glorify you, but like, how do I do this? I can't, please don't tell me to do the MySpace thing all over again. I don't, that took so many years. I don't know what I'm doing. Algorithms are a different thing now. Oh gosh. Uh, and I don't ever want to do that again, never again. <laughs> and, uh, so, so like six months goes by and then, uh, <laughs> I see this ad on Instagram. Um, there's this gentleman named Talon Michael. He's like the, uh, he, at the time, he was like the biggest Christian YouTuber on the planet. Mm -hmm. And he's like, are you trying to get your ministry seen? Are you trying to grow? And I was like, oh gosh, no, this is, this is it. <laughs> so I, I look at it and in the comments is a comment from my favorite, uh, you know, online minister, former pastor. Uh, I don't, uh, his name is Isaiah Saldivar. He's, he's had the most impact on me lately. And he's in the comments. And that was my verification that this wasn't a snake oil salesman mm. that type thing. So um, that's when I started doing all the, it's been 74 days now, uh, two and a half months of the TikTok stuff, the, the, the shorts, the reels and Instagram and YouTube. I'm doing it on all of them. And um, so it's just getting my, me out there. And um, I think it's funny when people are like, quit using Jesus for likes. Cause I'm like, no, I didn't want to do this at all. I hate this, you know? But now I see the whole reason I went through that and was, uh, and had that entrepreneur, I, the natural knack for branding and everything, and went through everything I did was practice to now do this for the Lord. And he, he told me, you're going to do this and I'm going to rest, rest restoration tenfold is the the thing I keep hearing. So on my space, I had broken like 150,000 people or something, which back then was like, it's like asking your parent, how much was that house? And they're like, well, we bought it in the eighties. Like if I tell you uh, yeah. thousand dollars, it doesn't sound like a lot, but today it's like a million. So right. it's kind of hard to, to like, you hear that today. Like, Oh, that's not a lot, right. but it would be the equivalent of like a million today. Um, and so that's like what's going to happen. And so I'm doing all this stuff and I'm making all these shorts like, hey, you know, if you believe in Jesus, subscribe for more. Because it's like the goal is to be a minister full time, leave the day job, do, do the Billy Graham thing online full time. And um, the a most amazing thing happens out of all these videos, I'm making three or four a day. My testimony is the one that goes viral. 
and makes everyone <laughs> so I, was like, I could cry, you know, well, no, it's good. all of them. <laughs> it's just an, it's an interesting story. And, you know, um, what's to your point, you know, ministries are really very much needed. And um, there have been a number of people that I've come across that continue to say that they keep hearing people, you know, preach, uh, but their Sunday ministers are not preaching about what's current. They're not mm -hmm. applying it. And, um, and I think, you know, you're applying it even though you're not a Sunday minister, you're an online manager, minister, you're using current technology to build your ministry. And I think anything that's current and look, you know, anytime you're coming to Jesus, you're, you're, it's, it's a journey. Um, and it's not a short one. Um, right. it, it's one of those things where, you know, you, it's not in your timing, it's in his. Exactly. And, and you just don't know where you're going to end up. Like I ended up writing for what the Western Journal um, had never anticipated that happening. Just fell into my lap and I felt moved to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the doors continue to open. But um, it is a, 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 a the Catholic, you know, you mentioned about the Catholic religion. I think the Catholic religion is really, really very good at the rules and regulations that go along with being a, a Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes where they fall short is in making it relatable, making mm -hmm. Jesus, making God, making the lessons relatable. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're having such an, an issue, you know, getting bodies into the church where these charismatic or, or more Christian, non-denominational -denom -denom based churches are are next starting to collect mm -hmm. collect people because people are searching people yes. are searching and what do they they flip on tiktok and there's booty shaking and violence and you you need to uh you know you can pick your own gender and whatever the algorithm dictates the narrative and so when christians say don't get on these uh platforms and they try to make it like you're trying to make it about you i say Congratulate! You're a linebacker for Satan. You're you're, you're doing a great job. But like, get out of God's way. We are jumping in here to disrupt the algorithm and to be a cog in the wheel of machinery because this is a generation, especially Gen Z, who is so lost and they're getting all their information. Constant. They're like zombified by it in front of these screens all day. So let's just hit them in the face with Jesus and snap them out of it. And so I believe that if Billy Graham were alive today. He would be doing that. It took him years to reach millions, and now we can do it in a month because of the technology. And I truly believe, and this might be a little bit of a wild statement, but I think if the apostles had the technology and they were like, Jesus is casting out a demon, let's get this on a platform so people can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe they would have because hey, they wrote the books. They wrote the they, books. They, the whole they wrote the books. Them, it's, right? the same, yeah, it's the same thing. They just happen exactly. to write the books. So you I know? think it's like a great tool. And um, I, I do believe <clears throat> that Gen Z needs to be reached through things that Gen Z pays attention to. I don't mean we become like the world. I don't I don't think I should be twerking for Jesus on TikTok or anything like that. But you know, <laughs> if they flip through three of those videos and then they see me saying, Are you sure you're not going to hell? And they stop for a minute and they get the gospel real quick or they actually the to, to be honest, the short form content, um, and this is through the program I'm working with with Taylor and Michael, is actually a funnel to the medium form, which is the gospel. I have a gospel presentation video. I have my testimony, which also has the gospel in it. So it's, it's like anything else. You, you, the, the short forms, the little TikTok videos, mm -hmm. and I didn't even want to do TikTok. It's which is what I make the videos on. Um, right. I'm trying, I actually, my goal is to be a YouTube minister because you can have a community there. Right. Um, but they're the billboard, you know, the, the right. McDonald's billboard. They make you hungry. They don't explain what's how the burgers made and all that. They just go, oh man, now I'm hungry. I'm gonna maybe go to McDonald's. The ones who do, now we can now we can say, hey, here's the here's the the meat. Like let's talk about the gospel. So that's yeah. the whole idea behind the uh, the short form stuff. And so there's a difference between viral, kind of catchy stuff, 
and yeah. what my ministry does represent. And, and the vision for that is to reach these lost people because I was once one of them and give them the truth in a, in a world that's bombarding them with lies right now. And I think, you know, I think the Gen Z group are definitely lost in that realm. I mean, there's a lot of silence and mainstream media is very silent. You know, it's very, it's, you know, Jesus is is very silent in mainstream overall. Um, they will ban him. I've seen clips with like athletes where they Photoshop him off the head. CNN had a guy on. He started talking about it and they cut him off. So yeah. that's another thing I say. Quit using Jesus for likes. Uh, you can't even <laughs> say his name on TV. I would do anything but Jesus if I was going for likes. Trust me. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I think that you know uh, he's he did say that he would be going away for a while, you know, and he would be silent, but his followers would 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 know he was there, and yeah, I think that's what's happening. So yeah, the, the he's um, and that's he's what going. I feel is we're working with to right. get these things out is you know the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's on the move. Right. Right? He, he's on the move. I think there's a big harvest. He's on the move. Yeah, I can. T because that, look at the evil. The evil is rising at such an alarming rate, especially post. I keep saying these flag words. I don't want to. Schmovid. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get us in trouble here. Cut off. But, um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> but it. since then, <laughs> things have been really radically like accelerating on the dark side. And I think I think God is raising up radical people right now to meet that. I don't think the old ways are working as much, kind of like you said, it's, you know, the, they kind of, I believe they need to sort of pass the torch down because things are so radical on this side that you're seeing people like Kat Von D get saved. You're seeing like right. these really extreme people like myself who are like, wait, you can, oh, I'm a witch, I'm a warlock, or, you know, I, I'm gender bending, wearing lipstick and dresses that you can't relate to me. You're like Ned Flanders. And I'm like, I could school you on this stuff trust me you know and we have the look we have the tattoos and stuff so we can kind of reach an area that might not have been reachable before yeah and, and well, it's, I, it's really i yeah. I, I, I just believe there's, there's something going on right now that there that, is I mean. there, there's an enormous evil and that evil has become so loud and so mm -hmm. enormous that it you know it's almost like it's it's revealed itself Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there is definitely a move. And, you know, what's interesting is you're seeing these different groups all of a sudden, like yourself, or you are an individual, but there are groups like Field of Faith that, um, you know, are collecting thousands and thousands, millions of Christians across the United States on fields um, and having prayer and worship. Um, that doesn't just happen. There no. is a hunger, and there what is was that a school, uh, Ashbury or something like that. that yeah, that, that, that was one of them. Yeah, I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be yeah. doing an interview with those guys. Um, oh, that's so great. Yeah. But it's just, um, it's there's just a, such a need, and I think because people are wandering around lost, they think they knew. I think in the United States especially, but definitely across the world as well. I think we all thought that we knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And we, the big reveal happened somewhere between 2016 and now, mm -hmm. where Precisely. we just realized that we knew nothing, <laughs> that everything we thought we knew was wrong. And <laughs> so people are like, try, or that we're all like, you know, we're all like floundering in the sea of, you know, right. what is going on. So we're, they're reaching and they're reaching out and, and I think that um, that's one of the reasons of the movement. And I believe, I believe that God allowed it. I mean, he's, he's in control of everything, I, I right? Yeah. So God allowed it um, because it was getting so crazy and we were not seeing it. We were blind as blind could be. He couldn't yes. get through because he was being eliminated from society. And so right. <laughs> he... Exactly. he yeah, I mean, he eliminated from schools, you know, and then and yeah. then you pull him out of this, and then you you, know, you close down it churches. Of, uh, Israel, ancient Israel, when they started uh, idolizing and letting all the other nations in, and um, sort of falling away, and they weren't really the, the prophets were warning them, like, stop being so lukewarm, like, are you, what are you doing with these Canaanites, like, you, right. you, you're forbidden, and they're like, oh, we're fine, we're God's chosen people, we're the elect, like, calm down. I feel like the church kind of got complacent and sort of 
just got used to being America, the most Christian nation, and we just, there wasn't really any work. And then we're doing the idols of today, you know, let me go um, watch some witchcraft show on TV and go to yoga later on. And like, it's like they're, they, it's, they sort of have the same, like, we're fine. And yeah. so the, uh, the calamities that come across upon, uh, you know, Israel with the famine and the plagues and the, the, um, death and, you know, like losing the other nations, taking them over Babylon coming in and just destroying Israel and taking them like Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar's and stuff. Like I see this sort of same Jeremiah Ezekiel kind of stuff with that. I just see it today with China and like the certain political parties and in the media and stuff like that. And it's like, you can't, just expect to be protected from it if you're going to be a lukewarm nation who got used to that and and not everyone people fought for the god not to be pulled out of schools and stuff like that but generally the church i think i think in the 50s and and earlier was a lot more dominant in culture and had a lot oh, um, yeah. more of a stronghold and then since the 60s it's been a slow burn and and then like you said in 2016 that set first was that election that set off something and then the 2020 stuff really like it was like wow like we're squirting a bunch of gasoline on the fire and then 2020 was like let's just bring the truck in and dump it on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and now it's like what just happened that's you know? what's happening course, right and they closed the churches down and everything and now it's like well what do we do so there's like i said there's a group of us that are like we need to be extra radical to combat this and then there's another side of the church that's very god's so overly sovereign we don't have to do anything we're just going to sit in fetal position and wait for him to do it and i think it's a little bit like david had to pick up the stone and sling it at goliath he didn't just crawl on the ground and go you do it you know god of course was willing right. it through him but i think there's a synergistic element and i i think some of us get that it's like a warfare worldview versus a blueprint worldview Right, right. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, there is thought that the Bible is not only a historical accounting, but it is, it was written to be the plan for which we were supposed to navigate our future. And, um, and so it's not just about history, although history right. is very important. It's also to help guide us as we move through the future right. it's not and, a history, um, it's an instruction manual <laughs> right <laughs> exactly I mean. revelation is in the future the book of revelation and the third verse says blessed is he who reads this and heeds it so there's a futuristic element there where the bible's telling us to be aware of the the story's not over jesus is coming back and so yeah i think we're in a in the middle of it or you know i i don't I don't mean precisely in the middle of a timeline, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, know. We don't know when, but <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So some people are saying we're at the end of it to get ready. Mm -hmm. We're all going to go home. And then the other yeah. are like, I, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. I feel about that. We're, I, we're not going to know anyway. He said, he's not yeah. going to tell us. Like, to he was just, the church real fast. Talk about he's, that. Yeah. He's just going <laughs> to, he's just going to yeah. show up one day to come with me. <laughs> so, I, for me personally, I believe we're in the end time. Times. I just don't, I'm not somebody, the, we, we don't know, is it tomorrow? Is it in a hundred years? I, we've been uh, in the uh, end times uh, since uh, Christ yeah. rose from the dead. So, yeah, uh, so. But I do feel like a lot of the stuff that's prophesied in the end times is like happening. It's kind of weird, you know, even a, a, a mark of a beast, like, of course, the, the that is wasn't the mark, but something has to pave the road in order for that system to be made, right? So it's kind of strange yeah. that we're seeing these these things sort of unfold with globalism. And you, if you told someone in the uh, 70s about the internet that, you know, they wouldn't have this end times thought process because it's so radically different to them right. than their world. But here we are now with the internet, globalism. Um, you know, Amazon has technology now to scan with your hand to purchase your groceries at Whole Foods. So if you told someone this in the 60s or 70s, they'd be like, you are put them in the mental ward. You are out of your mind. And now it's yeah. like very strange to see. Yeah. Wow. This actually could be happening, you know, in the not yeah. so far off future. <laughs> well, I think that it was a recent article came out. It could have been even been within the, the day or two that um, Bill Gates said 
he was quoted as saying that you will not be able to participate in society without um, a digital uh, right. identity. Um, right. And and that's that's definitely scary. And and <laughs> I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not participating. I guess. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Do I not. Guess I'm not. Listening to this, don't take the mark. The Bible says not to. <laughs> there is an element of worshiping the Antichrist, though. They kind of go hand in hand. So, I mean. I, the people who have the Holy Spirit in them, who really do believe in Christ, uh, are, are going to have a natural inclination to say, "Fine, lock me up." Like I'm, this my right. eternity is way more important than your, your uh, Bill Gatesness, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> fine, do what you got to do. Lock me up. I'll grow. I'll grow a garden and milk some goats in my backyard in, in the Appalachian Mountains if I have to. I don't need your your social credit score and all that, you know? <laughs> it's so crazy. Bill Gates used to be such a hero, right? I, I mean, he used to be Everything's such flipped. a hero. You notice that? Everything's sort of flipped around. <laughs> it's like the it people, really uh, like I, I think of people like Kennedy, who was an MTV VJ. Now she's like a Fox News correspondent. Gavin McGinnis, who in, invented Vice Magazine, who which is like the most lefty magazine on the planet or website now. He's like a conservative, like super right wing talking figure and it's kind of like i don't think they really changed i think the everything just shifted you know the goalposts. <laughs> yeah you know it's interesting even um joe manchin announced that today that he's not going to be running again he said that the democratic party has become so uh, disliked and in you know i mean he didn't say but uh you know terrible <laughs> that, that um that he just doesn't want to be associated with it. And he's going to yeah. start looking yonder to see if he, there's a moderate movement um, with the yes. participant possibly running for presidency on that moderate movement. So it's yeah. interesting to see that because, you know, Joe Manchin is, you know, I mean, he's served as a Democrat for many, many years. And all of a sudden, so left is right, right is left, mm -hmm. up is down. And, yeah, like classical and, liberalism of JFK is is over. It's it's so it's, that is like today's uh, moderate, and that's being generous. And yeah. like the uh, I think RFK has said something similar recently. It's just like I'm so ashamed. Like I was doing this, but I'm not. This is not the party I want to be associated with anymore. Um, I I don't know if I'm misquoting him, but I I did see something on Twitter. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, it's the, kind I of the mean, same thing. And I like I think him, but just yeah. not on I like everything. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's like that reminds me of like the Democrats of the 80s, not now. It's totally different now. now it, it's, it's like, well, it's there's the, <laughs> yeah, that party. The party is just um, un, it, it's unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but it's been you infiltrated know, by Marxism and things of that nature. So it's it's not even I, I, I was even at the height of my uh like chaos chaos and craziness it's funny i still had conservative values like when i would date somebody i didn't want to be cheated on go figure you know no <laughs> open relationships and stuff like and it was funny because i didn't realize growing up catholic i think they were instilled in me so i would be hanging out with pagans now you know and all of a sudden i'm like why aren't people understanding like why it's not okay to have like five boyfriends you know like they don't get it and so i had these weird it was like a, a dichotomy inside of me like i want to be an awful person do whatever i want but you, i have a certain value system which is funny because it was objectively from the bible and i didn't even realize it <laughs> well you know it's interesting that's what happens you know i think a lot of people today um what's been leading up to this evil is just that the ego you know, we've been such an egocentric society. Yes. Everything uh, that's valued it has it has to do with the ego, right? And, the and you really you, the narcissism, right? <laughs> and it's all about me, 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 mm -hmm. me. And because of that, we have really just create created a society that's so unhealthy for us, yeah. and every which way. Yeah. And um, it's and so it's one of the reasons. Yeah, right. that's one of the reasons why we're suffering in our own loneliness. Right. We have all this opportunity to connect, and yet we're still suffering. Our own. We're one of the loneliest societies mm -hmm. at this point we've ever been. And I've you know, actually it's... noticed it even in the church, because the church can dip its legs into culture, one leg in the pool and one leg on the concrete. And um, 
so you know being I, i'm not married i'm single and i so i'm like oh well let me go on a christian dating app and and you know it's christian so it's it will be different and I, and the worldliness that's it's it's kind of like um it, i could say this about the conservative party too because if you are a conservative there's two types of conservatives there's those who conserve <laughs> and they come from tradition and what is tradition it's it's christianity judeo-christian values is what built western civilization with a touch of greco-roman but the thing is conservatives who don't hate sin they just hate the left are not somebody i like to me it, you know you can go on a conservative dating site and to, and I could meet a girl on there and to her conservative is I drive a pickup truck. I have a Trump flag on it and I like guns. That's not, that's not like, it has to have God in it in order. And I think that's a big weakness of the conservative party as well. You, you see, um, I don't want to say any names, but you see some of these big conservative uh, websites and these talking heads. And then they have like strippers at their events and um, you know, they're, they're celebrating, to win the culture wars, they're celebrating things that God forbids. And I'm yeah. like, well, that's not really conservatism, maybe political conservatism, but the, the left is so religious with their values. They're crowning jewels of abortion and things like that. They'll fight you to the death over it. And they have that tenacity. They'll, they'll scream at you with drool coming down their chin. Right. And the other side is like, we don't have that because I don't think we have that z zeal for the Lord anymore. Uh, you I know. Yeah, I think that's true. I think um, Speaker Mike Johnson. Um, yes, I made a short about him, and that yeah, went viral. He's, I'm he's, so happy to see him. <laughs> yeah, he's he's gonna change that a bit because he yeah. lives and breathes that, and he's genuine. You can see that he's genuine. We and, need that yeah. in the White House. Is actual. We need representation. Christian. Yeah, because that's okay. what's gonna. When Trump brought the Christmas trees back and Jesus back in and all that stuff. It was amazing to see because what were we doing before? We're lighting it up rainbow colors and all that and lighting up buildings pink for abortion, and all doing a lot of very like demonic things. And so it's funny because you could have a hundred uh, lefties in the White House doing all that demonic stuff. And it takes like one guy like Mike Johnson. That's all the light you need to just scatter the roaches. It's so much more powerful than the darkness. So we just need it like is. five of him and we should be able to turn the tables, you know. But that's what they're <laughs> frightened of. I think right. that's what they're frightened of. And that's why, you know, trying to crush the movement, they're mm -hmm. going to continue to right. try to crush the movement and you just have to continue to fight. So yep. you need to continue to fight. I exactly. need to continue to fight. And I think that that God is, is assembling his soldiers. I mean, yes. you, and I can honestly say you, me and whoever else is like now just all of a sudden move to this side of the of yeah. media or or, sure. or or anything speaking voicing voicing his name bringing yes. him back into society and you know and and reminding people that he's still here i think and um and to to lean on him during these difficult times it's hard mm -hmm. but um but you know sometimes you need the hardest of moments to bring him back and you had a very hard the moment moments. you found him right? <laughs> right when you have the hardest of moments he shows up well, we're going through very, the hardest of moments, so yeah. he's showing up. But it's and like you said, who's had a, a dark time can they're not. It's not the end for them. If they're still alive and there's still air in their lungs, uh, David cheated and then killed the guy, the the husband of the woman he cheated on, and said, "Take not your Holy Spirit from me." He he. God still had grace on him, you know, right. to forgive him. So. If people are thinking like, well, I've done a bunch of bad stuff like that. God stuff isn't for me. Like it's it, it's for you. You know, you don't right. have to be desperate like I was. Deliverance is for the desperate for sure. But even if you're somebody who's just gone to church on Sundays and it's just something you do, but then you're going to the bar every night and you're uh, going to the casino or the strip clubs or something, th th it's it's time to 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 come back to the Lord and just live for him now, because we need that right now. If we're going to maintain anything good in the country anymore, otherwise we're just going to go straight into Babylon and it's going to be what we see in these blue cities is going to be like spreading across the country. And that's not okay. <laughs> Absolutely. It isn't okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, I'm thank so you for having me on. 
listen, do me a favor, send me the link to your YouTube channel so I can add it into um, the little write up we all do with these videos. Okay. And, um, and this way people can will know where to reach out to you. And I, I told you I'm going to have you back again. I will. Love it. um, it'll be Love a it. lot of fun to do that and, in the this new is my year. First interview in over 10 years. So ah. this is special for me as well. And I plan on doing a lot of this kind of stuff. I, I'll, I'll have a media page and all that on my site because this right. is this is a lifelong thing. But this is great for me because it's the first one. It's it's getting me back into the game. And Good. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, my God. It's my pleasure. It is my pleasure. All right. I'll see you later. Thank you all for right. coming Thank on. You. We'll talk yes. soon. Bye -bye. All right. Bless you. Bye bye. Wasn't he something? What a story. Right. So, yeah. Um, it is amazing how Jesus can move you to, to a place that you need to finally be. Um, but those journeys aren't always easy.